But I simply want to tell you today that the vision is not enough. Vision is not enough. It's great to dream, but a dream without work and sacrifice and struggle is just a fantasy. I talk to a lot of people that dream, but they're not willing. All right. And, and sometimes, I, I tell you, uh, the great, great poet, Maya Angelou, I'm not going to curse because she has a curse in it, so you'll know where the curse word is. But, but she simply says, if you want to fly, you got to give up the stuff that holds you down. Most people have big dreams where they're not willing to let go of the stuff that will elevate them to reach their dreams. Many people can articulate with great clarity what needs to change, but they're not willing to be a change agent. Many people are, allowed, are easy to curse the darkness, but they fail to light and kindle the fire. What I want to talk to you all about very briefly is that vision is not enough. We are standing here not just because someone had a vision, but because we cultivated the community and every day did the work to make the vision a reality. Now, since those days in the 90s, I've been a mentor to children in the city that have been like now family. My mentees are like my little brothers and, and, and nephews. And, I was having a conversation with one of them about school, and I asked him, well, what's your dream for your life? And he's like, I want to be a businessman, and I want to do this. And I said, okay, well, is going to school important? He go, yes. And I said, well, you're getting straight A's. No, I'm not. Okay, well, let me see it here. Now, now, your vision, your dream for yourself is to be a successful business person. Is doing well in school worth it? And I go, he goes, yeah. Okay, then why aren't you getting straight A's? Oh, it's hard, it's difficult. And I go, well, let me step back for a second. If I was going to give you a million dollars today to get straight A's in school for the next four years, would you do it? He goes, heck yeah, I'd do it. And I'll go, oh, wait a minute, you do it for a million dollars? Yes, I would. Okay, what would you do differently? And suddenly he started articulating his daily plan. Well, I wouldn't watch TV anymore, I would study. Well, I wouldn't do this, I would do that. I would, he showed me the way to get there. And I said, so you're basically telling me you would do it for a million dollars right now, but not the millions of dollars you could make as a business person in the future. That this is not an issue of can you, it's do you have the will to do what it takes? Because many of us have dreams, but we're not willing to give up what we want right now for what we want most of all. I can't tell you how many times the alarm has gone off at the time I was gonna get up, not to get to work on time, but get up to work out because I wanted to look chiseled. <laughs> but clearly, if you look at me in this tight suit, it's a little more tight this year than it was last, that I was not willing to give up what I wanted most for what I wanted right now, which was to sleep a little longer. I, I can't tell you folks that there is anything that's worthwhile that is easy. God never promised us an easy road, you know that. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He did not say he's gonna get you around that valley, that it was gonna be an easy street. Weeping may endure through the night. Joy does coming, but you gotta go through a lot of weeping to get there. Now this is the frustrating thing to me, because we live in this microwave instant moment where we want things right now. We want to just flip a strip and think it's easy. If we don't get it, we start complaining about it. But every bit of progress I have seen in my career, from the transformations we see happening in Newark to the work on the national level. I was talking to, to a friend of mine just the other day about what it takes to make real change and the work we had been doing. And the work, one of the things I went to, to Washington to deal with, and I was not, I didn't hide the ball when I was running in 2013, everywhere I went, from the wealthiest suburbs in New Jersey, back to communities like the one I still live in down the street off Martin Luther King Boulevard, I said, I'm going to Washington. One of my main goals is criminal justice reform. 
Because I, I've seen this mass incarceration. I, I, I've seen the ills of a nation that, as Brian Stevenson says, treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. I, I, I've seen a nation where we now have presidents and senators and governors talking about their marijuana usage. But children in our communities are arrested for marijuana charges four times greater than, than, than white folks in privileged communities. And there's no difference in marijuana usage. There's no even difference between marijuana sells in our country. In fact, young white men sell marijuana a little bit more than young black men. And the problem is, and we know this, it is economically devastating our communities. The mayor knows this, so you and I d d walk the same path. We work so hard to get a company to come to Newark and to hire locally and all of that, and then we find out that they're not gonna hire a kid, some 23, 24 year old, because he had a criminal conviction when he was a teenager. There's 40,000 collateral consequences when you are arrested for something. You can't get a job at a McDonald's. You can't get a loan from the bank. You can't, can't get student aid. And so we went to work on this, unglamorous, difficult work. At the local level, folks like the mayor and the council trying to change laws. We reformed our court systems here. We created, in, under my administration, first ever youth court, first ever veterans court, trying to make people sure that people don't get caught up in the system. We had governors, like our current governor in New Jersey, changing laws. We started seeing efforts to decarcerate, to try to change the reality that the United States of America, the land of the free, has one out of every four incarcerated people on the planet Earth, trying to change the reality in the United States of America that one out of every three incarcerated women on the planet Earth were in our country. We tried to change the reality in our country 10 years ago. There were more black people under criminal supervision in the United States than all the slaves in 1865. So here, here's what she wrote me to stay encouraged, because I've been frustrated of recent, trying to get some more laws changed, but we've passed some big laws, liberating thousands of people from jail. So she wrote me this note to stay encouraged. The road has been long, the work has been difficult. There have been struggles and setbacks and frustrations, but we have made progress at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, your work has not been in vain. And so she said the most recent data shows that in the United States of America, over the last 10 years, the black incarceration rate has been halved. Black men are now more likely to graduate from college than go to prison, which is a reversal from just a decade ago. The overall prison population in America is down 20%, representing 40 million fewer people experiencing prison or jails. And here's the kicker for people who think there is a, a, a conflict between public safety and incarceration rates. Well, the crime rates fell the farthest in states that have experienced the deepest declines in incarceration. Because we know in this room that when you focus on education and not incarceration, a community does better. When you focus on rehabilitation and not repeated incarceration, a community does better. When you focus on drug treatment or mental health care, a community does better. But all of these things do not capture national headlines. I can't turn on the TV and not get angry about what our 24-hour news stations pay attention to. I'm tired of getting turned on the TV and hearing debates about my president's age and no focus on the bills that we've gotten passed to do things in our community. The mayor and I talk all the time about the stuff that really is important. We have the lowest in unemployment rate for black people in the history of America right now. We have the highest rate of black entrepreneurialism and businesses in the history of America right now. We have the highest rate of black people being covered by health insurance right now. These aren't glamorous stuff, they're not dominating headlines, and they took work, sacrifice, and struggle. I, I remember just trying to go in and work with the Biden administration on stuff that they knew was not gonna get them headlines. 
But I knew how important they were. Getting lead pipes out of the ground, which this mayor set a national standard for doing. Other cities coming here to see that work. That is not sexy. That is not glamorous. And we now put enough money in the budget to get every lead pipe out of every city from Flint, Michigan to Jackson, Mississippi in the budget to get it done. We had a press conference here in Newark. I try to bring these cabinet secretaries to our city. Something that doesn't sound sexy, but tree planting, Mayor. We literally put in the budget enough money to have the greatest, in the history of humanity, the greatest number of trees planted in, in, in urban areas ever. Why? And the mayor knows this. We're on a heat island here. Our asthma rates are four times greater than other. There is a map together of asthma and trees planted. We knew this is not sexy, but it has real health benefits for a community. Amen. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me read you the wisdom, to put it simple, from Alice Walker. She, she has this great book. I hope people pick it up. It's old, but it's wise. In Search of Our Mother's Garden. And, and, and she has an essay in it called The Duties of the Black Revolutionary Artist. Mayor Baraka knows something about revolutionary artists. His daddy was one. And, and think about this quote. Think about the Black Panthers as I read this quote. What were they doing in Oakland? Feeding programs. What's the Willie Hart going to be doing? Feeding programs. This is what Alice Walker said decades ago. The real revolution is always concerned with the least glamorous stuff, with raising a reading level from second to third, with simplifying our history and writing it down so people don't forget it with helping people fill out food stamp forms, for they must eat revolution or not. The dull, frustrating work with our people is the work of the real black revolutionary artist. It means, most of all, staying close enough to them to be there for them whenever you are needed. This is what we're talking about here. This is revolutionary what's being unveiled right here. It is the dull, unglamorous work of what it takes to build strong communities, to support healthy families, to empower the dreamers to have pathways, not always easy, but real pathways to achieve their dreams. And folk get this mistaken all the time, but the Gospels talk about it. To do this kind of work does not mean you're going to be popular. To do this work never means you won't be beloved and heralded on that 24-hour news channel. They're so obsessed with all the things that don't matter. This is what matters to families. I am tired of people mistaking celebrity with significance. Popularity with purpose. How many people celebrate you all when you all are alive is not as important as how many people you serve. I tell you, we know this culture we're in. So many people are concerned about how many people follow your tweets when you should be more concerned about the work you're doing in our streets. So many people concerned about how many people look at your TikToks. I want to know the work you're doing around our block. Come on now. Come on now. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution. The revolution. The revolution. The revolution will not be televised. But we know what we need. We know the freedom we seek, and it is accomplished by those folk who don't get the heralding. I'm glad, before the senator and the mayor, I'm glad that the pastor brought up people, some names you never heard of. No newspaper's gonna cover these incredible people here. 
this extraordinary couple who I have watched for 25 years do the humble, unglamorous, painstaking, detail-oriented, hard work. And I have never seen their name in a newspaper. I've never seen them on TV. But they are the revolutionary artists that know the vision is not enough. Somebody has got to do the work. And so let me finish with this. Let me finish with this. I, I, I love, I love my mayor. I'll tell you why. Because when real mayors are tested, I didn't really know who Roz Baraka was when he was given his first inaugural address, man. I, it was a beautiful speech, but I was still holding my breath a little bit. <laughs> Like, oh no, the man's got the helm of the city. You want to know when I truly knew and started preaching the gospel of Raz Baraka around the country is when Newark was on its knees. Yeah. I served during the Great Recession as the mayor of this city. Mm. Unemployment rates were up, not at an all-time low for black unemployment, 25%. That's when the real test, when we had a Republican governor, no money coming in the city, the heart, there was no right choices. That's when my medal was tested. Roz and this council got their test during COVID. And I wish the people knew all the things that he was doing during that time. I knew it because we, our teams were beaten. So let me take you to end this with, with one of my tests when I was mayor. It was a storm. And ladies and gentlemen, we're in a storm right now, a metaphorical one. Come on now. I never thought when I sat down with John Lewis as a colleague of mine, my hero, I never thought that I'd have to sit with him and ask him the painful question of what does it mean to make so much progress on voting rights and then have the Shelby decision, a conservative Supreme Court gut it and have some states begin to write laws they could have never written in the intervening years. North Carolina, they wrote a law that the federal judge said it was almost like you were trying to dis not deny, disenfranchise blacks with surgical-like precision. I, I never thought that we would make these strides for reproductive rights and then have them pull back with, with the Supreme Court making a decision that allows states to literally criminalize women and allow a rapist to put a bounty out on a woman who tries to go get an abortion after being raped. I never thought that we would see strides that we made in labor rights and women's rights and civil rights come under backlash. I never thought that after George Floyd, there'd be a backlash against uh, simple ideas like equality and inclusion. We're in a storm now. And so here I was, mayor of the city, and Hurricane Sandy was coming in and... And, 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 and I was telling everybody we had to get off the streets. We were working to, to make sure people who were experiencing homelessness had places to go. We were working. And as the storm started coming in, it was late at night. And I said, let's go one more round. I asked my officers to jump in. I jumped, jumped in the command vehicle. And I said, I'm going to take one more survey of the city. And as I was in the West War driving a long strip, suddenly the telephone rings. Now, forgive me for being impolite. But the telephone rang and I answered it and I believe that I was immediately asked the stupidest question in America. Now I know people say there's no such thing as dumb questions, but bear with me for a second. Somebody said to me hallelujah if this is not a stupid question. I'm riding the command, the wind is shaking our car. One more pass through before we hunker down in the South Ward Command Center to make sure we weathered the storm and got back to work. Blow it, and phone rings and I answer the phone and the person on the other end says, hello, this is the White House operator. Will you hold for the President of the United States? <laughs> and I'm like, who says no to that question? <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I miss Obama. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I miss Obama. Yes. And I miss her husband, too. I miss her husband, too. I miss her husband. Oh, I am. Yeah. But Michelle, I miss you. 
Pastor, if Michelle had just married me, I'd be president right now. <laughs> I'd be the president of the United States and I'd still be coming here to church. <laughs> so it was Michelle's husband on the phone. Now imagine this. He's sitting in the Oval Office seeing the storm of destruction work its way up the coast and the Commander-in-Chief of the United States of America calls the mayor of the city of Newark to check in on the people of Newark. It was really moving to me and fortifying to my spirit. And we had a brief conversation, maybe five, ten minutes most. I was, I was blown away by the conversation, blown away by his grace and concern, and I hang up the phone. And, and almost as if it was planned, but it wasn't, the phone rang again, and I answered the phone. And this time, it's the governor of our state. Now, I'm sorry, this, this is no time for partisanship. The tribalism in our country has gone too far. This is the governor of our state calling me to do the same thing, which is to check in on me and the people of the city of Newark. And me and, and the governor have a conversation, and I'm touched by his concern, and we talk about plans for when the storm stops and how we could be partners to each other. And I hang up the phone. And now I'm going up a hill in the West Ward, and I look at the top as the lightning is coming down, that suddenly I see that all of the trees had come tumbling down already at this intersection, pulling down all of the telephone poles too. It was a horrific mess of wire and wood. But then I see through the dark of night, through the savage storm, through the rain, I see a big floodlight being waved at me. And I'm wondering, what, who is that? And we get closer up, and I see a man in a yellow slicker holding a floodlight in front of all that damage. And, and we slow down. We would have stopped anyway to survey the damage and make a plan, but now I roll down and the officers pulled me right in front of the man and I roll down my window and now I see him closer. He's an elderly man and a yellow slicker holding this and I'm angry. I know the mayor understands this. I had given a curfew, everybody off the streets. And so I yell at this man, forgive me for my elder, but I raise my voice over the wind and the rain and I look at him and I go, what are you doing out here? And this man looks at me like I just asked him the stupidest question in America. <laughs> he looks at me and he goes, Mayor, Mayor, look how dangerous, look how dangerous this is. I'm standing out here to make sure that no one comes along and gets hurt. I had just talked to the President of the United States of America in the Oval Office. I just talked to the Governor of the State of New Jersey, calling me from the Governor's Mansion, drunk so I can. I'm the Mayor of the largest city in the state. But the greatness I saw best exhibited that night was the man in dark of night, in savage storm, in driving rain, in the most dangerous conditions, with a light in his hand, protecting other people. And Jesus says, no greater love hath a man than this, than to give his life, to live his life. I have been to the mountaintop, and I have seen Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That is the vision, but the vision is not enough. You got to stand in the storm. You got to fight against the rain. You got to overcome the obstacles. You got to make a decision every day. I will not yield. I will not be deterred. I will not surrender. I will not give up when it comes to the cause of my people. I am a revolutionary artist. I love not with words, but with deeds. And with that, I will say, we as a people shall overcome. Thank you.